much, everyone, for being here. Um, today, I want to tell you about the best practices for server-side rendering in Angular. Uh, so as mentioned, my name is Gerald Monaco. You can also find me on GitHub and Twitter under DevNull. And I'm an engineer on the Chrome Aurora team. Aurora partners with open source web frameworks like Angular to improve the user experience across the web. You've heard our name a few times today. My colleagues Alex Castle, Katie Hempenius, and Kara Erickson previously worked to, for example, bring you the ng-optimized image directive. For about a year and a half now, I have been working with the Angular team on server-side rendering and hydration. Before that, I spent about three years working on React server components and streaming server-side rendering in Next.js. But that's not why we're here today. Um, as you can probably tell, I'm pretty passionate about server-side rendering. So I was pretty excited when I had the opportunity to collaborate with Angular, especially at such an exciting time with features like hydration being landed and adoption growing pretty rapidly. And that adoption shouldn't be very surprising. Server-side rendering and hydration have a noticeable impact on your core web vitals. As Jeremy mentioned this morning during uh, the keynote, Virgin Media O2 saw a decrease of 72%, which is about 1.3 seconds to their largest contentful paint times by enabling server-side rendering. And across the board, we've seen impressive improvements for websites that enable it. And there's even more coming. Be sure to come back here tomorrow where my friends Jessica and Doug will tell you more about what's cooking. What I'd like to do today is help you understand how you can be ready to take full advantage of all of these goodies. So let's take a look at our agenda. Hydration is what really makes or breaks server-side rendering, and so we'll start with a quick introduction to it and look at some of the pitfalls that you might encounter. And then we'll look at how those pitfalls can be addressed uh, by using Angular's transfer state API. And finally, we'll look at some best practices for DOM access and manipulation using APIs like after render, after next render, signals, host bindings, and more. We've got a lot, so let's get going. Starting with hydration. Fundamentally, the best practices for hydration or for server-side rendering are all about ensuring that your server-side rendered application can be hydrated. And hydration might seem like a frightening word or concept. It's not something that we've had to really think about at all in Angular until recently. But really, it's just a name for the process of taking what was rendered by the server and using it as a starting point for executing the application locally on the browser. And ultimately, the thing to keep in mind is that your initial DOM generated on, uh, generated on the browser needs to match the DOM that the server serialized. Otherwise, Angular won't be able to hydrate, and you'll get an error. And generally, there are two things that can cause the DOM to be mismatched. First of all, the, state of your, uh, the logical state of your application could be different. For example, because the server rendered uh, using different data from your backend than the browser used. Second, APIs like Renderer2 or the DOM could be used to manually create, update, or remove elements before the application hydrated. So let's look at what we can do to avoid some of these things. Let's start off by supposing that we're building a to-do list application. We'd likely have some sort of to-do service to manage our state. And initially, we might be tempted to have a pretty trivial implementation of our Git tasks that looks like this, where we just fetch tasks directly from the back end. But consider this. During server rendering, if we go and execute this function, fetch tasks from the back end, and render them. Later, during when the browser is running, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to execute the function, fetch tasks from the back end, and render them. But if our tasks have changed in the meantime, then we're probably going to have a mismatch, and we won't be able to hydrate. So this is a, one case where transfer state will come in. Transfer state is a key value store that is serialized from the server to the browser. It makes it straight, fairly straightforward to address these sorts of state and data mismatches. And the API is pretty simple. First, we create a state key. This couples a, the key tasks to the type of our data uh, being stored, an array of tasks. We inject the transfer state service. And then finally, we read and write values. Angular will take care of all the uh, serialization in the background to, this, uh, to the browser for us. There's even more goodies in the API, but um, this will suffice for now. Now, using transfer state, our Git tasks implementation might look something like this instead. We'd start by checking our transfer state for a value. If we're running 
uh, if we're on the server when this first runs, uh, we probably wouldn't have a value here yet. So we'd go and fetch it uh, using our backend as before, or perhaps some other underlying service. And then we would go store the latest value back to the transfer state so that Angular can serialize it to the browser for us. Later, when we run this code again on the browser, uh, a value would have been added to the transfer state for us. And so we can read the value and use it directly. With a few more tweaks to this, uh, mostly along uh, cleaning up our uh, subscriptions, this will be pretty ready to go. This is the normal way you would want to use something like transfer state. Uh, the list of tasks here is exactly the state our application needs to successfully hydrate. So it takes a little bit more effort, but it's worth it since we eliminated any opportunity uh, for mismatches. And by the way, this example is perhaps a bit contrived. Um, it turns out in some cases, uh, depending on, for example, if the endpoint requires authentication or not, Angular will actually do this all for you. And so your original code would just work as is. But I wanted to show you transfer state because it's a really good tool to have in your toolbox. Um, for when you need it. So now let's shift gears to talk about the DOM. Uh, this topic's a bit nuanced, uh, because not all DOM manipulation is necessarily problematic for hydration. And I don't want to just limit our discussion to manipulation of the DOM either. Uh, today, Angular spends quite a lot of effort to make it appear as though there's a DOM uh, uh, running during server-side rendering through a feature called DOM emulation. It's useful in some cases, but ideally applications would be able to opt in or out of this. And so today I really want to focus more generally on all DOM access, which includes manipulating the access DOM. Um, and I also don't want to just give you bullet points that are of things that are good or bad. Uh, instead, I want to try to help you understand um, what ideal DOM access looks like so you're best prepared to tackle the problems that you encounter. So what is ideal DOM access? It's localized DOM access from after render, after next render, or in response to a user interaction. But what does that actually mean? So localized. DOM access should be localized. That is, you shouldn't try to access DOM elements that are owned by other Angular components. You should really treat everything that isn't normally accessible uh, with your viewer content queries as a sort of black box. Otherwise, you risk things unexpectedly breaking when you know, the inevitable change happens. Um, and ideally, DOM access would occur after the application is rendered and hydrated on the browser. Remember, we need the browser DOM to match the server DOM in order to be able to successfully hydrate. Um, by only accessing the DOM from after render, after next render, or in response to a user interaction, we sidestep most of the potential issues we'll see. Um, uh, so if you're not familiar with them yet, after render and after next render are hooks that were added in developer preview in Angular 16.2. They can be used to schedule callbacks that Angular uh, will run after it is finished checking for changes, updating, and hydrating the DOM. Uh, these functions also have another superpower, which makes them uh, ideal for DOM manipulation, which is phases. Each after render and after, render, after next render callback uh, is grouped into a phase, and all the callbacks in one phase will run before any of the callbacks in another. This is really useful for making DOM manipulation performant. For example, suppose we're building a tooltip component uh, that should follow your mouse cursor around. We would uh, first read the size and position of the tooltip in one callback using the early read phase. And then in a different callback, running later in the write phase, we would compute the new position and write it to the DOM. And this is really great for performance. Anytime you try to do something like read the layout of an element in the DOM, after changing that layout, the browser needs to first recompute it. If we've had multiple elements or multiple components doing this, we would be forcing the browser to recompute the layout quite a bit, harming performance. Uh, by splitting up our work like this into the appropriate phases, uh, Angular is able to minimize the number of times that we need to do that uh, layout calculation uh, across every component and directive in your application. And since we're using element ref here, this would be a good time to talk about it. Ideally, you would use it like we are here, which is that you should ideally keep your element ref wrapped and only unwrap it and access the native element inside of after render, after next render, or in response to user interaction. This follows from our previous definition for ideal DOM access. 
since element ref is really the nexus to DOM access, if we don't unwrap it outside of one of these places, not only do we sidestep potential issues with hydration, but we also don't need Angular to emulate the DOM for us on the server. So that's right and all, but uh, how do we actually achieve ideal DOM access? I want to share some examples that we encountered in the Angular component library that you might also encounter yourself. One pattern we see is something like this. We have some value that we bind to in our template, that then we would go and mutate it. But if this mutation ends up happening after Angular has already run change detection, for example, an after view init or a callback from some child, um, we'd run into the dreaded expression chain to after it is checked error. And the canonical way to fix this, at least according to Stack Overflow, is to just wrap this in a set timeout. <laughs> We've all done this, uh, but this isn't great. Uh, we've introduced things like extra paints on the browser, um, a little delay during server-side rendering, and we've created a potential headache for ourselves, uh, for anyone else trying to use our text variable here. Um, and another idea that you might try is to use DOM manipulation, ending up with something like this, where we just use the DOM directly as a source of truth for our, valuable, our variable. Um, but this, uh, this isn't ideal either. Sure, it's localized. Uh, but our element ref is not being, is not guaranteed to be unwrapped only in after render, after next render, or from a user interaction. In fact, we kind of hope it doesn't. Um, fortunately, there's a pretty easy way to address this now. If we go back to our original approach, we can actually just refactor this to use a signal instead. Now we don't run into any errors, and it's likely that you can just do this sort of uh, change as needed without needing to adopt signals elsewhere in your application if you're not ready yet. Um, we saw something very similar with other DOM data. For example, um, we would, in some cases, unwrap an element ref to manually add a class to it. And you can use a similar approach in those cases as well. Instead of manually changing classes or other data to, uh, via the DOM, you can use Angular's built-in support for host bindings together with a signal. Here. We're just going to uh, use a computed signal to determine the set of classes that we want to apply. Angular will merge all of these values with any other class bindings that we've set and apply it to the uh, element. And we can use the exact same approach for attributes and styles, too. This is great. Not only have we eliminated the expression changed after it's checked error, we've actually eliminated DOM access altogether. Um, another pattern we've seen is where DOM access is used to try to locate some elements that have been projected, um, which is not ideal. Uh, not only are we not accessing the DOM in uh, after render, after next render, or in response to a user interaction, but our DOM access isn't localized. Since we're using this query selector all here to try to find an element owned by a different uh, component. Instead, we should consider that somebody else had to render our component, and they're rendering that content that we want into it as well. So instead of manually searching the DOM for the element that we want, uh, whoever is rendering our component could just be required to give us exactly what we need. As a bonus, we could also add some documentation here explicitly uh, making it clear that um, we're going to be doing something with this element. This is an improvement, but we could probably do even better. If there are just a few well-defined things that we need to do, we could probably benefit from a much more focused API. Uh, maybe we could expose this as an interface instead. Now there's a crystal clear contract with the users of our component. Uh, sometimes the parent might be even higher up in the uh, tree. If we wanted, we could use hierarchical dependency injection here as well. The great part about both of these uh, last two approaches is that, once again, we've actually eliminated DOM access altogether. And the only thing better than accessing the DOM in an ideal way is to not access it at all. Uh, so that was quite a lot to uh, digest, so let's recap. Uh, we learned that uh, the DOM in the browser needs to match the DOM serialized by the server in order to successfully hydrate. We learned that there are two primary causes for the DOM to be mismatched. Our underlying state or data could be different, leading to a different DOM. And we learned that we can use transfer state to solve this, or in some cases, Angular will just do it for you. Um, second, our application could be mutating the DOM before hydration using render to or uh, manual DOM APIs. We've learned that we can solve that 
by keeping our DOM access localized inside of after render, after next render, or in response to user interaction. Um, I'm also excited to mention that uh, the Angular uh, components team actually uh, took this advice and has um, uh, made these changes so that the Angular components library now works great with hydration and server-side rendering. Huge shout out to Christian for all that work. Um, and so I hope that you will give these practices a try in your own uh, work to help your applications and your libraries work great with server-side rendering and hydration as well, um, and all the new exciting features that are on the horizon. Um, if you see me around, I'm always happy to chat. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>